I came downstairs just to get everybody's natural reactions and it was priceless. It's better than I thought it would be. Yeah. Um, but it's just shocking. I just want to say for the record that unlike, just for as an example, unlike say Andy Martino, who wears a mustache and thinks he's like a Renaissance man and looks more handsome than ever, I feel more unattractive than ever. I know it does not look good. I just want that out out there in the world. Hey everybody, welcome to another Tri-State Cadillac Living Room Edition of Baseball Night in New York. Doug Williams alongside Todd Zeal and Steve Gelbs. I apologize for my appearance today. Um, this is just, I got peer pressured into keeping it after terrifying my family yesterday. They thought, comedic effect, you should keep it for the show. Uh, is that okay with you guys? Are you going to be able to focus on our topics as we move through here? Keep keep what, Doug? What what, what have you done? I can't. I, can't I don't see, any I don't see anything. Yeah. yeah, I don't see no. anything. Okay, that's good. Then uh, let's just move on from there. Um, le- today we're talking about rivalries. And um, this is – the reason that I think this is going to be interesting is because we have, uh, you know, Steve who covers the Mets so closely year in and year out. Todd, who obviously played uh, in the big leagues for a long time. And I, ha- I often think that rivalries are something that's fan-driven. It's something that uh, fans in the ballpark, either they – Uh, think that a certain team is a bunch of bullies and they want their favorite team to beat them or they don't like a certain player or group of players. But Todd, in your experience as a player, are rivalries real? Are certain ones more intense than others? And do you think that that has changed since you played and and today's game? Um, Yeah, I think, first of all, I think rivalries are real. I think they're a little more fan driven as you were alluding to. Um, especially now in the era of um, interleague play and guys switching teams so often where um, it used to be like if you, if the Dodgers and the Yankees um, never saw each other except in the world series, that seemed to be a big rivalry because of the stemming from New York. So um, I think things have changed. And I think one of the things that was interesting to me during my playing career is like the Mets and the Braves had a good rivalry. There were some things that fueled that the Braves were, obviously very good through that stretch, 13 straight uh, NL titles. And at the same time, they had some players that um, sort of really exacerbated that, um, that rivalry, like Chipper Jones, Brian Jordan, who had some big hits. And even John Rocker um, was a guy that was so polarizing. Um, I remember the Mets fans just filling Shea Stadium to see if they could get a piece of John Rocker for – insulting New York and the subway system and anything else racist that he had had tried to add to his vernacular. I think the closest thing, though, to an actual traditional throwback rivalry that I have seen on the beat has been with one player in particular, and that is Chase Utley. And it was with Chase Utley when he was with the Phillies. You saw the carryover from, you know, Chase Utley's this old school type of player that you think about when you think about rivalries. And, and he was kind of one of the, the last relics of that that I've seen and so you go back to 2015 that game I believe it was in April where Matt Harvey threw at Chase Utley and then stared him down as he walked towards first base and then obviously when Utley was with the Dodgers in 2015 and uh, and had that vicious slide that broke Ruben Tejada's leg that was pure true authentic anger coming from the Mets team after that happened I remember being in the clubhouse Uh, what was it, game two in L.A. where that happened? And I remember being in the clubhouse and Michael Kadire speaking to the media and what the fans couldn't see because the cameras only shoot in his face is that his hand was actually shaking in anger down below as he was talking about Utley, David Wright the same way. And so that that was a true rivalry. That was true dislike, hatred even, that carried over obviously into 2016 when – you know, Noah Syndergaard threw behind Chase Utley and you had the famous uh, backside in the jackpot incident. Right. Of course. Um, the rest is history. Todd, you mentioned earlier interleague play. Is it the lack of familiarity thing? To re- is that the main reason why things like what happened with Chase Utley and Ruben Tata used to happen more often than they do now? Well, I think guys used to be associated with the team they played on. Now guys are kind of their own individual players and brands. One of the things that I think um, was really interesting when I played was there's some rivalries that you don't think 
um, would, would really exist. And one of those, uh, when I was with the Cardinals, and then again with the Dodgers makes more sense, but the Giants, the San Francisco Giants were the most vicious fans that I had ever been a part of. People think Boston, think uh, Philly or New York as vicious fans. San Francisco, especially at Candlestick Park, I guess you had to be a little vicious uh, to go and, and endure that weather and put on a parka for a, a July baseball game. But um, by the time about the fourth inning rolled around and the, the, the guys that were in the upper deck were able to slide their way down and get behind the dugout, um, I'd never heard such vicious ragging um, from any fan base uh, since I was in college and it was USC, UCLA. So um, there's some interesting rivalries, but that, that San Francisco uh, Cardinal one stemmed, I think, to, to uh, Gelb's point from um, Ozzie Smith uh, making a tag on Will Clark, falling on top of him, Will getting up and pushing him. And then, and that stemmed from a World Series that then that got exacerbated. I want to show us a, a clip here, and we're going to share the screen with you so you all can see it. Um, these are fans in Taiwan, and I'm calling them fans um, to be nice, but they're mannequins. Some look like they're cardboard cutouts, and then there are some real mannequins, as you see there. That's terrifying. Um, I'm not really sure what it does, um, who it benefits. Uh, maybe it makes the TV audience feel a little more normal. And why are they wearing masks? Can we, can we go to a time in our heads um, from before all of this where we don't have to see the masks? Can we just have mannequins without them? Um, I'm uncomfortable. I, Steve, what do you think of what we're looking at here? Yeah, I'm exactly the same way. I, I Listen, I actually do understand putting masks on just to set an example for the rest of the country. But the whole point, I would assume, of throwing mannequins into the stands is to make the atmosphere feel more normal for the players playing it. Todd can obviously speak to this more, but I would think that that would freak out players more than an empty stadium. What silence could be more eerie? A stadium that you just know is empty. Okay, I'm going into an empty stadium. It's going to be silent. Or a stadium that looks full of creepy mannequins, and that silence to me would be more eerie, Todd, if I were a player. Yeah, maybe the uh, maybe their audio video guys are going to have some laugh tracks and some cheers and and stuff like that. They got one guy up in the booth. He can make it interesting. And you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna take the cynical side of this a little bit. If you go back and look at all those fans, they got advertisements across their chest. All right, guys, time now for the walk-off. Most impressive thing you've accomplished around the house during this working from home period. Todd, let's start with you. I power washed the whole backyard. I wanted it to look sparkly and clean for BNNY and my you. living room addition. And uh, because they're like limestone tiles, um, and, and I have a, a, a case of, uh, you know, we can call it OCD, um, I felt like I had to clean every tile individually. So it was like a 10,000 piece jigsaw puzzle of, uh, of power washing for me. That's impressive. Steve, can you talk yeah, that? No, I, I can. I actually power wash this beautiful wall behind me. So you really can't see anything going on back there. No, honestly, I, uh, I think my biggest accomplishment is going to come moments after we hang up this call and, and this show is finished. I'm, about to take a crack at fixing a dishwasher so wow. that Nicely could done. be that could be the topper i have other than my mustache really not done anything impressive during this period uh i will say that the other night we had a couple we had two frozen fillets and you know it's an accomplishment sometimes when you really uh you take something frozen that you maybe never thought you'd actually eat <laughs> You thaw it, and I grilled it, and it was perfect. And that's just a small victory. Hey, at you least grilled, the three of us have that in common. There's been some, there's been some good cooking going on, uh, and I manned the grill last night just like you, Doug. So, uh, yeah. Ooh, ooh. Right? Uh, Thank like you. Tim Allen. Tim Allen would give that a, a bit of a, you know, a manpower uh, grind right there. So. All right, guys. This has been entertaining as always. Steve Galbs, Todd Zeal. This has been another Living Room edition of Baseball Night in New York. It's brought to you by your Tri-State Cadillac dealers. Thanks for watching, everybody. We'll see you tomorrow.